Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the Technology Showcase brought to you by the Call IS, uh, Computer Assisted Language Learning Interest Section. Uh, we have now the on the cutting edge graduate student panels. We're, we have three presenters. The first uh, session with uh, V. Lee, and her session is Cloud Computing in School Teachers' Feelings of Comfort Integrating Google Suite for Education. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is V. I'm from Vietnam uh, originally, but I stay in uh, Canada to uh, study my master's degree in educational technology. So, I want to share that I'm really happy to have a chance here to talk to, uh, to share my insight about my thesis. I just started my thesis eight months ago, and I will have two more months to finish it. So I hope that I will share with you new information today about cloud computing, yeah. So here you can see an, a lot of cloud, so I, I call it teachers in the cloud. Of course, it's not the real cloud. I'm talking about cloud computing, which is really now a hero, a new hero, a new train in education. And um, in British Columbia, uh, there's many school district apply Google Suite for education right now, and they got a lot of pressure and controversy around that. Here is some news in 2018. A lot of parents in uh, British Columbia, they didn't agree to sign the consent form to have their kids have Google accounts to use in uh, their school because they afraid that as soon as the kids have uh, the uh, Google account to use G Suite, the data, their data will be stored in the US, not in Canada, and which is not, for them, not a safe thing to do for the kids in Canada. So I have a question in my mind that teachers, the person who use the G Suite directly, do they concern the same, or do they feel confident, and do they have enough training to use G Suite in school? So I came from Vancouver Island, and uh, my place is the school district in Nanaimo and Ladysmith. So I conducted my research in that area. Yeah, so I'm wa I want to looking for the challenge of a teacher because the teacher already used a lot of technology in school. Now, when the school district got the pressure to use G Suite in school, how do they feel? They feel confident enough or they feel overwhelmed by the mesh integration of G Suite? And uh, Nanaimo Ladies Mid District Public School is the place where I conduct my research. This is my research question. So basically, I will looking for two score. The first score is the level of uh, in, uh, technology integration in general. And the second score is the feeling comfort of teacher toward G Suite. And I find a relationship between them. My hypothesis is that when the teacher feel comfortable with G Suite, they also have a high level of uh, education technology and uh, vice versa, if they have lower level of uh, technology integration in school, they will feel uncomfortable using G Suite. In my, the literature review, I have three key areas, which is teachers believe in using technology in school, teachers believe in cloud computing in education, and cloud computing in education a review. I just share with you the second and the third ones because they are really interesting to share. Okay, 
about the teacher belief in cloud computing in, uh, in education, I actually really cannot find any literature review or article that focus on teachers' belief in cloud computing. I just find an article that they talking about the belief and perception of the Swedish school principal in 2017. And it's found out that from the school leader level, most of the principal, they believe in the benefits of the G Suite, of the cloud computing. However, their biggest concern are related to security and privacy. They also share that there's a lack of shared views of belief among the school leaders and others, educational stakeholders, including um, uh, governments, policy maker, uh, technologies leaders, and teachers, and that challenged the adoption of cloud computing in school. And the final one, they share the conflicts regarding cloud computing providers and privacy agreement inside the country because they they realized that um, as, as the same case in Canada, as soon as the data of the, the, the student store in another country, it will conflict with the legislation in Sweden. Okay. Another literature review I want to share is the benefits and risk of cloud computing in general. For the benefit, cloud computing provide a new, create a new environment, learning environment, where uh, the student, the teachers, and IT staff can have a lot of uh, application that improve collaboration and communication. It's also enhance the flexible learning environment by combining e-learning, personal learning, group learning and blended learning. The second benefit is that cloud computing also help to support evaluation and management. And the third benefit is that provide a cost saving learning environment with higher demand of computer computing resources. And some risk using computing in cloud computing in education. The first one, security and privacy. And um, the literature review say that uh, preventing leaking the data can help from uh, improving the knowledge of the educational practices and also come from the transparency of using data of the service providers. The second risk is vendor locking. Vendor locking happen when the data protection fail, when you change from a service to another service. So if you use, for example, if you use Google at the very first time and then you change into Microsoft because they not, they not work together well, so your data protection will be failed. So this can be solved by asking from the providers that they can work together to help the um, educational practitioner use different hybrid clouds that protect the data better. And the, the third risk will be poor performance of cloud services and internet connection. From this literature review, it also recommends some research issues that need to be done in the future. Uh, these are some, and my research will my research will satisfy the research about public clouds and focusing on teacher demand and to student progress. Okay, going back to my research design. So, my research design is a quantitative research. I'm trying to looking for two score by uh, giving survey to the teacher in Nanaimo Ladies Mick uh, School Districts. And uh, I would try to get the teacher's level of technology integration and teacher's level of taking risk and comfort while using G Suite and find the relationship between the two score. This is some of the example of the questionnaire. Um, there are seven, I will focus on high school 
public high, public high school in the school district. There are seven schools, but two of them didn't, didn't answer my invitation. And one of them, the Island Connect Ed, they actually um, an online school, so they use another tool. They don't use G Suite, so they cannot join the, the, the research. So I have four schools in total, and I got 23 answer survey. This is the survey distribution by technology access. So from here, you can see that most of the teacher, they can access well with uh, the technology like computing, uh, mobile lab, computer lab. And here's my result. So I got a really positive, significant positive relationship between the technology integration of teachers and their level of comfort feeling using G Suite. So it's proof that my hypothesis is right. As long as the teacher feel comfortable with G Suite, they also have a higher level of uh, technology integration in school and vice versa. If they have low level of uh, technology integration, they will have lower level of feeling comfort using G Suite. However, I still need to dig down into the data and I found out that there's a two outliner happen in my data. The first one, I realized that even the teacher use, uh, feel comfortable with G Suite, they not really have a high frequency use technology and this is not what I expected. So I need to looking for look back at the question about frequency using frequency uh, the frequency of using technology to find out what's wrong with my data. So um, the second outliner happened to my data is the data security and privacy. So I realized that even the teacher feel comfortable with G Suite, they quite didn't concern or worried about data security and privacy, which is really not what I expected. And also literature review has recommended that the teacher should aware about data security and privacy. And this is some of the conclusions. So I still need to run the data and have another better conclusion. But so far, I give some conclusion about my findings. And um, I, I, I conclude that this, uh, the school leaders need to be considered to provide training technology skills for teachers in order to increase the feeling of comfort of teachers using G Suite. And further research can be done to figure more what specific technology skill that teacher needs and further research needs to be done about teachers' view of data privacy and security. That's it about my thesis. Do you have any question or recommendation? Okay. Thank you, thank you, V. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, Martha? up next, uh, we have Marta How? Oh, sorry. <laughs> How watch? <laughs> How watch Kivic? Sorry, Marta Hawachkovic with Domesticating Pokemon, a study of one classroom application of using mobile video games with English language learners. Okay, Marta, thank you. Thank you so much, Claudio. Let me just quickly switch the slides. Hello, and thank you so much for coming to my talk. My name is Marta Hawaczkiewicz, and I came here from Utah State University, where I wear two hats. One of them is uh, an ESL instructor in their IEP program, and the other uh, hat is I'm a PhD student um, in the inst uh, Instructional Technology and Learning Sciences there. Um, so I 
thought that the best way to combine my two loves of English and uh, gaming was to do a PhD. And uh, one of my pilot studies that I conducted in 2016 uh, is, um, you're going to see the results of that pilot study today. So I love teaching writing. And in 2016, when the Pokemon Go came out, of course, I was playing it like crazy. And since it started in July, my writing class was starting in September. I thought, you know, why not test it out on my students? Um, so I did that. And uh, I combined it with my doctoral studies where um, I was looking at uh, gamified instruction. And um, what I did uh, is I designed a writing course in which my students had to play Pokemon Go and write about it. So um, I used uh, affinity spaces as my theoretical background. Uh, this concept was, was proposed by uh, Jim G. And um, affinity spaces are, uh, are real, but they could happen in, um, uh, in physical as well as in virtual uh, areas and uh, these are spaces that draw in people who share the same passion not necessarily same location that's why I said a lot of times they happen virtually but these are people um, just loving one thing and just geeking out about it um, together usually online and um, I chose this theoretical framework because a lot of that communication in affinity spaces uh, takes form of uh, writing. Hence, I thought, this is going to be good for my writing class. Um, so uh, some of the common um, concepts in affinity spaces is the common endeavor. And that's just um, the passion that draws people in. Here, the affinity space of Pokemon Go has Pokemon Go, the game, as uh, the common endeavor. Um, also, to access those affinity spaces, you need some portals. They're called portals, and they just mean uh, specific um, spaces. So, for example, a YouTube channel or um, a um, discussion board or a Facebook group or anywhere people converge to talk about their favorite um, thing. So. Um, one of those places that people always converge are uh, fan fiction sites, and that's where a lot of writing happens. People take their favorite common endeavor and just write about it. Uh, here we'll have a lot of writing of, uh, about uh, Pokemon Go uh, in fan fiction sites. And fan fiction sites, if you've never seen those, these are just websites uh, with um, um, publishing capabilities uh, where fans can share their writing, their fan fiction um, for free most of the time and comment on it and uh, give each other feedback. Um, there are also uh, affinity spaces where fans can share their translations and fun dubbing uh, off uh, on the YouTube channels or Reddit uh, or in different fan conventions. And if you've never heard of fun dubbing, uh, this is it where uh, fans dub uh, the, their favorite video or a movie um, uh, to their own languages. Uh, this usually happens outside of the States. Um, also, anime, uh, anime fan sites are very popular with affinity space um, um, members. And um, affinity spaces also include poetry. So there are specific sites uh, that allow fans to share their poetry. Uh, also very common are diaspora communities where uh, people from different nations will converge and talk about how what it means to them to be a foreigner in specific land. So for example, being uh, Polish people in the United States. And uh, they may not necessarily have that in their physical location, but they kind of converge online from different places in the States. Uh, also, affinity spaces happen in uh, games. So for example, um, voice tools or texting or chat rooms within games. Like um, World of Warcraft is um, it's, it's a game where you can actually talk to people, other people who are also playing the game. Um, so 
why did I decide to use games? Well, because they're a great motivational force. For example, Sims, um, uh, Neopets, and Pokemon, or Dun uh, Dungeons and Dragons have all been um, very uh, useful in drawing people to play more. Okay, they really inspire motivation. Um, they also, uh, it's been said, the games make things that are pretty mundane and pretty boring fun. So um, why not use games and make life fun? Um, they are also one of the most frequent common endeavors or passions of affinity spaces. So um, um, probably that's why I use them because there's a lot of literature on uh, game affinity spaces. Um, and on top of that, since I'm dealing with ESL students, uh, English language learners are very frequent participants. They're fans just like everybody else, and you can see them on affinity spaces a lot. So I had a whole summer to decide on my curriculum. So I um, created an assignment of game journals. I told my students, Wait, well, you're going to be playing Pokemon Go, and uh, you're going to be writing about your experiences in weekly game journals. Um, those, uh, of course, the, the, the game that I told them to play, the common endeavor, was Pokemon Go. And here, I didn't give the students a choice of a passion. I just gave them a passion. So that was kind of a tweaking of affinity spaces. That's how I had to adapt it for my class. Because uh, we know we, it's hard to force people to like something, so I just gave them something to do, not necessarily to like it. Uh, they had the freedom of uh, commenting on their game journals whether they liked it or hated it. And believe me, a lot of them did not like it in the beginning. And then finally, I created different portals for them. Um, as, if you remember, affinity spaces have to have some sort of a way, gateway to get into the affinity spaces, and these are called portals. So um, the portals that were accessible to them were um, out of the class, so they had to play the game, uh, go outside, play the game, play with friends. They also accessed portals online, so they had to, if they, they were total novices in playing the game, they had to go online and check out how do I play it, what do I do. These constituted uh, portals of uh, affinity space. In class, um, I gave them a portal of uh, discussion. This is where they posted their game journals. Uh, the discussion was hosted by our school's learning management system, Canvas, and it was only available to the students in the class. Uh, so they felt more, um, let's say, like their privacy was more um, uh, protected because only their classmates and I could read it. Um, and um, the online discussion, uh, the, the, uh, the Canvas uh, game journals were in a form of an online discussion. So not only did they post their own reflections of the game, but they commented on each other's. Um, so this is what they did throughout the semester. I planned it for 16 weeks. Um, now, on top of the curriculum, deciding what the students will do, I had to, um, I had to decide what I'm going to do for this project. So I came up with uh, three research questions. Uh, first of all, I wanted to see um, how do students participate in those affinity spaces uh, related to Pokemon Go. Um, in this academic writing course. Uh, then I wanted to also see how they perceive those affinity spaces. What do they think about them uh, as in using them in academic writing course? And finally, I wanted to see what they think about games. How do they perceive using video games in academic writing? So these were my driving uh, research questions. Uh, my participants, it was, it was a, a a class of 16 students. I got five of my students to participate. You can see they came from different uh, places in the world, and I had different majors. Um, but these were the uh, also uh, most avid participants of Affinity Space. Um, so I used um, different data sources for analysis. I used their game journals, which all came from that class discussion on Canvas. But also, after the class commenced uh, and after I've posted the grades, I interviewed them. Uh, I had about half an hour interview with uh, each of the five participants. Um, 
So for my coding, I used uh, qualitative co coding of both the journals and the interviews. First, I just used descriptive coding, just generally looked for what are they talking about. And then uh, in focus coding, I grouped them into categories. So what did I find out? Well, to answer my first question, how did the students or the participants uh, use the affinity space? It turned out that um, it, they um, had a lot of activity out of class in out of class affinity spaces. So they did a lot outside of the class. Uh, they um, they would use um, uh, internet to research um, how to play the game. They would were also talking to each other and other players outside of class. It looked like most of the time they were inviting or being invited to play. Uh, together with others, Pokemon Go. Uh, they shared with friends. I had students, uh, for example, I had a student from Japan who had played the game before she came to the States in Japan, so she would communicate with her Japanese friends, bragging about which Pokemon she got there that were not available in Japan and so on. And then, um, of course, they used the internet, uh, but also uh, they played with friends a lot, whether they were friends in the States or fr friends outside. So um, they also used Pokemon Go in, uh, affinity spaces in the class. So in class, most of the time, they used uh, the discussion board on Canvas. And as you can see, there's tons of different ways of participation. But the one that was mostly prevalent was uh, the social aspect of affinity spaces. They used affinity spaces for social reasons. So uh, just to illustrate, I pulled out a few uh, quotes from that. So a student, Zach, for example, say, now grab your phone and let's get, uh, go, go get some gym fights. So this is kind of like inviting others to play. Um, Takashi said, I'm level 6-2 now, so we can go to the Pokemon gym for, for Make Strong Pokemon. This, I just preserved the text as it came. Uh, so see, they, they were just inviting each other. Let's go play. Do it more. Um, Lucy said, uh, here it's more of like a, a, a they, use, they use the discussion form for a lot for, um, uh, for humor. So she replied to somebody, ha, 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 sorry. Same thing happened to me. Sorry you will g get there. So uh, this is more like um, laughing at somebody's failure, but in a nice way. And then um, Takashi, for example, say, hey, I want to see your Electrobuzz. Then I'll transfer it to the professor, ha, 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 again, kind of like a friendly banter. These were all social interactions using the discussion board, pretty much like what, what people do on um, Facebook, Instagram, any um, social media. Then uh, to find out how the students felt about affinity spaces, um, I uh, found out that, for example, Yolanda, she really liked it because uh, of the social aspect there. I could compare with friends what you caught and what I have. It was fun, uh, so it was pretty positive. Um, I also wanted to know what other people think. It helped me organize my mind. This part of my thinking is too far. I also helped to find approval of what I think, so Zach used it kind of for approval. Um, and then my final, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's not, not final yet. Then uh, Zach also said, um, it was just between us in the class. So he liked the privacy of the discussion board in the class. He felt like he could be honest and he could be himself. He didn't have to, have to say that he loved it. He could say, hey, I hated it. So he appreciated that. Um, Takashi said that uh, he could learn about where specific Pokemon were, Pokemon were on campus, and he found it out from his class, classmates, so he could hear, oh, the Pokemon were in this place, and he could go and catch it. And then Takashi also liked it because it was like Facebook or Instagram, so he liked the, um, the discussion board because it was familiar and useful to him. So. 
Uh, for my third question, how did students perceive video games in an academic writing course? There were some positive perceptions, so students liked it because of nostalgic reasons. Here Yolanda says, when I was a child, Pokemon was my favorite TV program, so when I was playing, I was reminded of that. And Zach said, when I heard about it, play a game for a whole semester, and uh, heard it was Pokemon Go, I thought it was so cool. So here she just liked the uh, novelty of it. And then Yolanda again said, um, I, need to, I needed to speak to other classmates. It helped me with a development in my fluency, and it made me talk to others, which is not my personality. So she liked the communicative aspect of playing that game. And then Katie, um, thought that it was a really good topic for conversation. So she could talk about that outside of class. However, there was also some negative uh, negatives or negative perceptions of using this video game. So um, Yolanda and Lucy both uh, said that the game was very difficult to learn. They were not gamers at all before that. They've never ha played a mobile game before or any game. So that was difficult for them. Uh, Lucy and Katie also had tech problems. Um, the game was in a, you know two or three months in development and there was still a lot of glitches. Students would lose uh, connectivity on campus. So they had you know typical tech problems or the game wouldn't load for them and so on. Uh, and then also students got bored. I planned it for 16 weeks because if I had been playing it for three months, surely everybody, all the millennials are gonna love it for three months, uh-uh. My students were bored after about, some of them four weeks, and everybody was done with it after six weeks. Takashi was the only one that played it through the next year. He played it longer than me after the class stopped. Uh, he actually identified it as a problem. So um, with three's negative perceptions, they were, not, they were not against playing the game. They're against those technical difficulties and just it ran out, the, the interest ran out. So here's a comment from Zach. The second week, nothing really interests me anymore. It doesn't have a storyline and it's, I'm lazy and I don't want to walk around. So he got bored within two weeks. And Yolanda, uh, she was a non-gamer, uh, but she really loved playing it. And then she said, but I played only for two months and then it was boring for me. So she still played for two months and then she was done with it, okay? So after this project, after this run for one semester, I noticed some benefits. Um, it definitely created, created a close-knit community. In the classroom, students got closer. They were, they were showing their Pokédex, their Pokémon before, after class, getting together after class, and it was just fun. Sometimes we, our class was next to a Poké stop, so we would just pull out our phones and just start catching Pokémon because they were there. And I would allow two minutes for that, and that was fine. Um, the students were really engaged in class. They loved writing about their experiences. They had so much to write. Um, I didn't mention this because it wasn't part of my study, but they also wrote essays. This was an academic essay class, and they wrote all of their essays were based on their Pokemon experience. So like comparison essay would compare the old Pokemon game to the new Pokemon ga game or to, to Pokemon and so on. Um, for them, it was also a change of routine. They weren't expecting to play a game in an academic writing class, so they really liked the change of routine. So based on that project, especially looking at the negative perceptions, I, um, uh, I created a list of adaptations for using video games in, maybe not Pokemon Go, because it's not a fad anymore, and it just, it's so three years ago. Uh, so, uh, still using video games for writing, uh, academic writing could still be beneficial. So, making sure that the games are simple. Even Pokemon Go was difficult for some people. So, making sure that you use games that are very, have a very, um, not steep, but the other way, learning curve. <laughs> Um, and then make sure that the games are tested. I pioneered a brand new game that had a lot of glitches. So making sure that the game has been tested, it works, and um, students are not gonna give up because of tech problems. Uh, and finally, making games, uh, using games that are captivating and will, um, with appropriate challenges. So this game was not captivating enough. After about a you know, few weeks of kept catching Pokemon, nothing changed. So this wasn't capturing students' um, interest uh, long enough. 
So um, based on that, I've, I've adapted it since. I've been teaching that class over and over for the last three years, but I've never used one game for a semester anymore. Uh, but using one game for a short time and maybe switching games, um, that's worked much better. Um, or using multiple games. Uh, so my last time I did this was last semester, and students chose their own games, and they could switch games, and it wasn't di dictated by me. They could start with Mario Run and finish with Call of Duty if they wanted to play that. Um, so um, this is, hold on, let me go back. This, is, um, this was part of my uh, pilot study. Based on the outcomes here, I designed my uh, dissertation study, which is in the proposal phases. I haven't defended it yet. But um, if you have uh, any questions about the pilot, or you have any suggestions, or uh, you just want to share your experience, experiences with using games and teaching, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, here's all my resources for any lit review or any uh, light reading. And this is my contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta Hawachkovich from the Utah State University. And next up, we have Sharon Jacob with examining the implementation of a computational thinking curriculum for dual language learners. My name is Shereen Jacob. I'm a PhD in education student at UC Irvine, and I'm in my second year. And so I'm going to be um, presenting my second year paper, and I am in the proposal phase. So um, this is a proposal, so stay tuned for the findings. They're coming soon. And I'm going to talk about examining the implementation of a computational thinking curriculum for dual language learners. And before I begin, I just kind of want to talk about computer science education. So we have math, we have science, we have history, we have all these subjects, but we don't have computer science uh, courses in the US. So um, computer science for California is currently working with the governor to draft um, standards for K-12, and now we have the draft standards, excuse me, actually for pre-K-12. And also, they're working on creating a single subject computer science certificate. So I think over the next three or four years, there's going to be a lot more research on computer science education. So this is really exciting, kind of in the beginning. And this is one of the first studies to look at um, computer science education for multilingual students. So I'm working on ConnectR, which is an NSF-funded initiative and a collaborative network of educators for computational thinking for all research. We're all very proud of this title. Um, and uh, we seek to promote computational thinking or computer science education for grade three through five students. And our partners are the University of California, Irvine, the Santa Ana Unified School District, which has among the highest percentages of Latino, Latina, low income, uh, language learners in the nation in the Orange County Department of Education. And so our goals are to investigate the teaching and learning of computational thinking and its potential for engaging diverse learners. And we've developed and are piloting instructional materials that meets the needs of our uh, predominantly Latinx student population. We're iteratively piloting for the, these materials for broader implementation and are, are now applying for a mid-size NSF uh, grant to scale it up, and we ultimately want to establish a successful research practitioner partnership as a model for computer science for all. So this is a research practitioner partnership. This is not an experiment where we're beginning from theory and generating knowledge deductively. This is a collaboration between researchers and our practitioners, Santa Ana Unified and Orange County Department of Education, where we aim to solve problems of practice that are of high priority to their participation participating uh, institution, which is Santa Ana. And we're using design-based implementation to research to design, implement, study, and refine the materials. So again, this is not an experiment with uh, treatment condition, but an iterative process where we pilot the materials, 
we learn from the implementation, we revise and refine. And we've been doing this throughout the year. And so in the summer of 2018, we developed a computer science curriculum or, or computational thinking, I'll explain what that means soon, to meet the needs of Latino, Latina, low-income language learners. And so what we did is we aligned the curriculum with um, computer science and ELD and English language arts standards, and we provide linguistic scaffolding. So we've provided the language functions of computer science for grade three through five students. We've in integrated inquiry-based uh, approaches to learning, and we provide culturally responsive pedagogy. What we've done is incorporated stories with diverse characters who are pioneers in the computer science education field. And so I've been talking about computational thinking. What is that? Many of you have heard computer science and coding. So computer science is a field just like engineering, medicine, biology the study of computers, including their hardware, software, al algorithmic processes, applications, and impacts on society. It's the subject. Computational thinking is a generalized skill. It's an approach to solving problems that uses concepts that are essential to computing, and it essentially involves formulating thoughts and questions in a manner that is communicable to a computer to achieve desired results. So there's a saying that the computer is never wrong. It's only the instructions that we give a computer that is wrong. So really being able to program sets of tasks to achieve specific goals with a computer. And then programming, you've all heard of this, is programming languages in C++, Java, Python. And there's a difference between computational thinking and programming. Computational thinking is often operationalized or learned through programming, but it can also be learned without the use of computers, which is often called unplugged activities. So it's a very generalized skill, and it's applicable to a variety of disciplines. And so in general, computational thinking uh, skills include automating processes, abstracting problems or models, thinking algorithmically, creating models, and analyzing data. Traditionally, computational thinking has been thought of in terms of the concepts involved, but um, at MIT, they talk about practices and perspectives. And we're looking at also, um, our qualitative data is looking at the computational practices that students use. So experimenting and iterating is how students design their projects. And when they have new ideas, they test it out and they go back and try new things based on new ideas. Abstracting involves identifying the pieces of the problem or model that you want to include and leaving out unessential details. And modularizing is once if they've abstracted their problem or model, essentially their program, then how do they organize their code? That's modularizing. Testing and debugging involves testing out your programs and when you encounter an error, finding the cause of the problem and identifying solutions and remixing and reusing. So we all have this stereotype of the computer scientist who's sitting alone in the cubicle behind their computer, but that's not true. Silicon Valley, this is a very collaborative enterprise, and computer scientists borrow from one another's code. They borrow from one another's design features. And so we look at students, how do they borrow from one another's designs and code? And um, you also have to attribute authority, or, or excuse me, attribute um, like citation, like how do they, cite the person, and this is actually an understudied area. So I'm working with grade three through five students. This is a media-rich programming environment for novice programmers, typically used in elementary school. They wean off of this into regular programming languages in middle school called Scratch. And here we have the stage where you can choose sprites and backdrops, the scripts area, and they drag these blocks in the middle over to the scripts area in meaningful ways to animate the stage to create games, stories, and animations. And so with this curriculum, I've developed the following three research questions. How effective is the curriculum in developing students' computational thinking skills? While engaging in the curriculum, how does their fluency in these computational thinking practices, I was mentioning, develop over time? And do students with more advanced computational artifacts have better understanding of the computational processes involved. And I'll, I'll explain what that means shortly. So I'm going to use a convergent mixed methods design, emphasizing the quantitative strand, um, in which the data samples will be collected concurrently. And we're, we are collecting data this, this year, almost finished collecting the data. 
the quantitative strand will look at how students develop their computational thinking skills, and the qualitative strand will look at how students develop their um, fluency and computational thinking practices, and this will provide, hopefully, a broader picture of the impact of the curriculum than either method alone. So the students uh, largely re reflect the demographic of the district, which has 93% Latino-Latina students, 89% low-income learners, and 60% uh, multilingual students or dual language learners in the elementary grades. We have used extreme case sampling to identify six teachers who have lots of experience teaching computer science to elementary students, and then 210 students, the students attending those teachers' classes, to take the, uh, the, the quantitative computational thinking assessments. And then we use maximum variation sampling to select a heter heterogeneous group of students to be interviewed on their computational thinking practices. So that's the qualitative strand. Data involves a pre-post test, personalized automated assessments, a scoring rubric, and student interviews. And I'll briefly go over each of these. So BEBRAS is a pre-post test, and this can be administered to students without the use of programming. So this can be used as a counterfactual. For example, when we do a randomized control trial, students aren't going to be in a computer science education course. So how are we going to test their computational thinking? So it is essentially a multiple choice test. It uh, assesses their gener generalized computational thinking skills. and. Um, so far on the pretest, we've seen a normal distribution on the scores. And then the personalized automated assessment was created by Diana Franklin at the University of Chicago. And um, this is a really neat uh, assessment. It goes into student scratch, scratch programs, pulls out pieces of their existing code, and auto, uh, generates questions about the code, and it's automated. So for example, this is a student's code they use in their project, and this question asks them about repeat. How many times uh, did they repeat? And you, as you can see, the answer is nine. And then the scoring rubric is just like kind of a portfolio using a rubric to score their projects. And we look at overall impression, does a program work, user experience, is it interactive, encoding constructs like variables, loops, conditionals, operators, and also initialization and termina termination. For the interviews, we're looking at these practices that I've been talking about. And the students are talking about their Unit 2 About Me project. So they were asked to make an interactive collage where they're to tell about themselves in Scratch, that programming environment I was telling you about. So we, as they're uh, describing their artifacts or their projects, we ask them how the project was built, did they try new and different things, how did they decide on the scripts? How are the scripts organized? Did they but borrow design and code from other projects? And uh, how did they test and debug the problem? So for the quantitative strand, I uh, intend to do a paired one tail t test to measure the difference in students' consolidated post-test scores and calculate effect size to determine the impact. And for the test score panel, which are these automated assessments that goes into their program and pulls other pieces of code, I'm going to do uh, summary statistics, plot a histogram depicting the distribution of raw scores, and calculate um, Pearson's co uh, correlation coefficient uh, of students' scores for each pair of exams displayed as a table presenting the cor correlation matrix. And then for the analysis of the rubric, I'm going to aggregate their three scores of user experience coding construct um, and uh, do summary statistics for that. And then I'm going to regress students' aggregate score on dummy variables indicating a unit with fixed effects for each student. And I'm going to uh, develop tables reporting the results. And so then we have this table which tests the null hypothesis that students did not um, increase their learning on the projects over each unit um, as such. So then we link the rubric and the test score. So we have this rubric that's looking at their, uh, their projects, right? But we don't know if students borrow from other pieces of code, if they learn from their classmate, if they understand their own code. 
So that's why we have this automated assessment that goes into their program and generates questions about their own code. So the question is, if students develop more advanced scratch projects, do they have an understanding of their own code? So we're going to regress students' aggregate score from their scratch projects on their unit test score to see if their scratch projects pre predict their test score. And if there's a positive correlation, then we'll see that students actually do have an understanding of their own code. And if there's a negative beta, we'll see that they don't have as deep an understanding of their own code. I mean, at least in a cor correlational sense, this isn't experimental. And then for the qualitative data analysis, we're going to analyze these interviews using top-down and bottom-up qualitative coding. So the deductive coding includes looking at these computational thinking practices, like experimenting and iterating. And we'll use evaluative codes, low, medium, high. We're interviewing them at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year to see if there's any progression in each of these categories. And then the researchers, uh, myself and my team, will generate new codes in the process when excerpts of text do not fit the deductive framework. And uh, to calculate reliability, a second researcher will randomly select 25 of the essays and apply existing codes to the text to establish reliability. And we will use triangulation member checks and negative case analysis. So overall, by conducting this research, we hope to develop a better understanding of the contextual factors that shapes children's development of computational thinking skills and practices, develop a broader view of the types of learning that take place as a result of engaging in the curriculum, and we hope that these findings contribute to the iterative refinement of the curriculum as we scale it up throughout the district and the region. So um, please stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have, we're analyzing data this summer. We're just finishing up data collection at the end of the year and hope to be able to disseminate the results uh, in the fall. Thank you, Sharing. So uh, we have now Marta and uh, V and uh, Sharing. And, uh, okay, thank you. Yes, Marta? Okay, so uh, we, we can take questions now, if you have questions. Hello? Okay. Sharing, I have a question. First of all, congratulations of, on the data analysis, and it's a good thing you have a team. Thank you. But that's amazing. Thank I have you. a quick question about the um, the automated analysis that pulls uh, their code from scratch and asks questions. Did, is that part of the thing you created? How? how oh, yes. So this was made by Diana Franklin and her PhD students at the University of Chicago, and so was, she actually has her degree in computer science. So it was made by computer scientists, and I'm not sure exactly what algorithms that they use. But essentially, it's an app that they connect to Scratch, which was that programming environment that I showed you. And it goes in and it looks at students' code and pulls out little chunks of code and then, and then generates automated questions to ask them about their own code. So yeah, yeah, so it's a really exciting test. We're really excited to be working with Diana Franklin. And um, she does some amazing work with assessment. In, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we have uh, any more questions? Okay, do we have online questions? No? All right, so thank you. This was on the Cutting Edge Graduate Student Panels. We had cloud computing in school, teachers' feelings of comfort integrating co uh, Google Suite for Education with Vili from Vancouver Island University. We had Marta Halwachkevich with Domesticating Pokemon, a study of one classroom application of using mobile video games with English language learners. Marta is from the Utah State University. And we also had uh, Sharon Jacob from University of California examining the implementation of computational thinking curriculum for dual language learners. Thank you, guys. And uh, next, we have uh, Developers Showcase. Thank you. <laughs>